So I just want to thank everybody for coming. And um, I know some of you maybe were a little confused about the link, but you got here. And if there are people who, um, who you know, colleagues of yours who would like to participate but couldn't get here, uh, there will be a recording. Um, we already have a recording of our previous session already up on our website. So I think, um, anyway, so there's lots of ways to get this information. So I just want to say that. And also just um, bear with me on my first time doing the webinar. I might have a couple of little hiccups, but um, so that's my disclaimer. I want to say that in the background, we have Patricia Love, who's the Executive Director of Communications at SMCOE and um, person extraordinaire knowing like all the rules and where to find them and so forth. So um, she's back there, she's gonna help us with questions and other technical um, issues. And then Jeannie Chevalet from San Mateo County Public Health Department, who's our school leads, school lead in um, helping with our linking schools to reporting at the Public Health Department of um, COVID. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeannie. Thank you, Jeannie, for coming again. And if, oh, uh, one other housekeeping thing. So if you have questions, just put them in the Q&A button down there. And um, Patricia and I will start working on answering those. And then we'll sort of try and gather them together by subject so that um, we can present them to Jeannie at the end of her presentation. OK, thank you. Thank you, Jill, I appreciate it. And I'm happy to be here again. I apologize. I know some of you attended the um, first meeting that we had last month. So much of this information is gonna be just a review of that, but there are a few updates and hopefully some clarification I can um, provide on some, you know, a few sticky issues that come up. Um, but thank you for the opportunity to talk to you all about our COVID-19 guidelines and um, reporting requirements here in San Mateo County. I know you guys have all been working tirelessly on your plans and your preparations and many of you have people, students already back in some capacity in your schools. Um, and so you've been navigating some of these tricky issues. And I just, we can't thank you enough for your work um, and for all the work to come because this is all new for us. Uh, and we're really looking forward to collaborating. Um, I really want you to feel comfortable reaching out and asking questions um, of our school's team. Um, we're all, you know, we have some great guidelines in place, but as you know, the guidelines are always changing. The protocols are always being updated. Um, so I think keeping in, in touch, and if you need to confirm something with a phone call, please feel free because um, it is definitely a dynamic situation ever evolving and, and how we respond to these situations. So um, my goal today is that we can make sure that we're all on the same page with the guidance as it stands from the county um, and that we leave here knowing what steps we should take when we have a positive case or an exposure in our school communities and then also how our efforts intersect. So just a few objectives. Um, we want you guys to be able to access our tools that we have for guidance and reporting, um, to be familiar with your communication pathway and confident in using it when you do have positive cases in the school community, um, be able to identify the steps that you should take when there is a case or a symptomatic student or staff member, um, and then be, be comfortable with the definition of a suspected case of COVID-19 when you really should be concerned. All right, so I know many of you are familiar with our checklist format for various outbreaks um, and also our line list for outbreak reporting, um, but this may also be new for some of you. Um, they, these are really the two key tools that you'll use to guide your initial response, as well as monitor transmission within your school or within your learning community, um, along with the protocols that you've already developed and the pandemic recovery framework from the County Office of Education, which complements these tools. Um, both of these can be found here at this website, um, smchealth.org provider slash COVID-19. Uh, it's under school guidance. 
And I am not going to go through the checklist word for word, but I do recommend that you take some time and read through it, familiarize yourself with the different sections before you have a case in the school, because then it'll be easier because you'll know where to go to look up information. I am just going to share the checklist briefly. Out of memory. Oh, no. Now I'm the one with technical issues. I was going to share that checklist briefly. Let me try that one more time. Oh, all right. Hang on one sec. Nobody panic. Bear with me. All right. There we go. I was just going to say, uh, Jeannie, while you were doing that, there was just a comment to say that if there's any, there are some people who attended the last meeting, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are new. So for those who did, I think somebody had a question to maybe point out anything that's new since September, yeah. since our last meeting. Yep, that's a great suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is the checklist. What we do is, again, it's available on our website. Um, but when you reach out and contact us and inform us that there's a case at your school, we will actually fill out this top portion of the checklist. Um, it's a way for us to make sure we have the correct contact person. Um, and then we will email it to you along with a copy of the line list that I'll get into later. So it's sort of customized for you um, to have, but it is the same content that's on the website. Uh, the first section that's really important here is definitions. Um, and the key one here is the suspected case of COVID-19 and what we're really concerned about um, when a symptomatic student um, crops up or a symptomatic staff member. So it's divided into two groups, right? So in the absence of a more likely diagnosis, so not someone who has a confirmed flu test or a positive flu test, right? When, when there's not another diagnosis, if they have one of these bullet points in the top box, so fever and cough, fever and shortness of breath, new loss of, of taste or smell, painful purple or red lesions on the feet, pneumonia or acute respiratory distress syndrome. That's highly suspicious for COVID-19. Um, so they just need one of those to get them into that suspected, um, su suspected case definition. And then you'll be kind of making some decisions off of that. And then if you look down in the second box or they can have at least two of the following criteria. So it's a long list. Um, but basically fever and sore throat, um, chills and nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. So two of these um, in that second box will kind of land them in the suspected category. And then there's some other definitions that um, you're probably familiar with. What's a cohort? What's a pod? Uh, close contact, the difference between isolation and quarantine. Isolation we use to, to separate the ill, sick individual. They are isolated. Quarantine is when you are separating a well individual um, to keep them away from others in case they do develop symptoms. So we those terms are often used interchangeably, but isolation is really for the case and quarantine is for the contacts. And then reporting requirements, which we'll talk about in just a minute in more detail. Um, and then this section I really like, it's our scenario section. So here it's steps to take in response to a confirmed or suspected case. So when you have a staff member that calls in with symptoms or a student that's sent home with symptoms, you're gonna kind of see where you fall in here, right? Where, you know, are we looking at a symptomatic student? Are we looking at someone who's positive? Are we looking at someone who's just exposed to someone who's positive? And then in this ne next column is, oops, is the immediate actions that you would take at the school. And then the next column is the communication steps you would take. So there's a section for, um, for positive cases, for suspected and for close contacts to, to positive cases. And then the next section also multiple scenarios um, in response to negative test results. So you would just look through here and figure out where your exposure falls and then what actions are recommended and what communication steps are recommended. 
And there's further detail on those responses here on the next page. And then I, I'm not going to go through all of this, but basically um, our guidelines on health screening, our recommendations on, you know, screening on site, screening at home, an example questionnaire, um, all the good stuff about physical distancing and masking, hand washing and hygiene, infection control. And then on the last page, we have an uh, algorithm, a flow chart, I guess, um, that lays out those scenarios as well. So if you're more of a visual person, this might be a better place to start and figure out where, you, where your exposure falls. And then if we just go back. All right. So reporting requirements. The first point here is that even one case in your school community, one staff member, one student, um, even with that, you need to call in and report to San Mateo County Communicable Disease Control. And that's our main line at 650-573-2346. You will get our officer of the day. It could be the officer of the day is on the school's team. And it could be my, myself or Sonia, my colleague, who's also another officer of the day. Um, or it could be that they will pass the message on to our school's team and we'll get back to you shortly. We're trying to um, have a dedicated group of people respond to these cases and provide consistent guidance, um, which is we're hoping will help with um, conflicting, you know, help with consistency and, and managing uh, exposures efficiently. Uh, the next step here, oh, so all COVID-19 cases and then clusters of undiagnosed respiratory illness, which is the same as every year that our, I know our school nurses and health coordinators are very familiar with. If you start seeing a, you know, a higher number of students out in a classroom or in your school community as a whole, then above your baseline, you're going to give us a call with that information as well. And then you're going to notify your district contact. Um, and then you're gonna go up your, your, you know, the district change. So your school will notify the district contact and then they will notify the Office of Education. And then the next step is we are gonna initiate line list reporting, even with just one case. And we'll go into the specifics of that, but it's basically a running spreadsheet that you will send to the health department, um, to our um, school's team every day by 10 a.m. Monday through Friday uh, via secure email. So what we usually do is we will have the initial conversation with you. We will send you an initial email with this checklist, with the line list, uh, summarizing what we went over and we'll send it to you via secure email. So you have that link and then you'll just continually use that link to email it back to us each morning. Um, and then school principal or designee will be in daily contact with um, the investigator that they're working with at CD Control. Um, you will need to submit a map or a floor plan of your school if you have not done that already. Um, feel free to do it ahead of time um, and we'll just keep it on file. It just helps us visualize a little bit um, the community and which cohort and especially if we have multiple cohorts with, with cases. Um, it can help us just look at potential routes of transmission. Um, and and the, the, these last two points, I think you probably have already been working on, but implement an internal communication plan for students, families, and staff. Um, ensure communication systems that allow staff and families to self-report symptoms. So, you know, families should know who they should call, right? They sh you should have a system. It should be clear to them, who do we call if my son wakes up with a fever? Or a staff member, if I, you know, developed a bad cough during the night, who do I call? Um, so there should be a, a designated staff liaison um, that can help collect that information and um, respond to potential COVID-19 concerns. All right, so this is just one of the scenarios from the checklist. Um, so I thought I would start with the most straightforward, a student or staff member tests positive. Um, although we never want anyone to test positive, the one nice thing is there are clear steps on what to do. Um, there's less of a gray area. So um, as soon as someone reports that they test positive, um, the school designee, or I know some of you are reporting to your district COVID person and then that person is contacting us, whatever system you have planned out is fine as long as someone contacts us, whether it's your COVID district person or the, the contact at the school. 
Um, the case should be isolated and excluded from school for at least 10 days after symptom onset or date of positive test if case is asymptomatic. And we'll go into that further later, but basically a for an average person with COVID-19, the clearance criteria for them to be able to discontinue isolation is 10 days from symptom onset, 72 hours fever free, and those can be the last 72 hours of the 10 days, that's fine, and an overall improvement in symptoms. Sometimes we extend that out to 14 days for someone who's immunocompromised or works in a high risk setting, um, but for the average person, it's 10 days. And then, the pod or cohort of that positive person is going to be quarantined and excluded for 14 days after the last day the case was present at school while infectious. So some people get very confused on that. Why is there a difference between the 10 days and the 14 days? You know, why is the case potentially able to come back sooner than the exposed contacts? And those are very good questions. But basically, the 10 days is based on the infectious period of COVID. So someone who's COVID-19 positive, how long will they be able to transmit the virus? 10 days. So the 14 days for the contact is based on the incubation period of COVID. So after I'm exposed, how long could it potentially take me to show symptoms and become ill? 14 days. So that's why those two timeframes are different. Um, often though, especially in the case of students, you have a student out for 10 days, their pods out for 14 days, it makes sense to bring that positive student back with their pod in 14 days, because you're not, you don't want to mess up your pods. So just, it just depends logistically how it works out, but the infection control piece, they're out for 10 days, but maybe logistically they come back in 14 with their pod. And that also helps protect confidentiality as well. Um, testing of contacts uh, can be considered and we definitely recommend it. Um, and definitely, especially with symptomatic contacts, but a negative test will not shorten the 14 day quarantine. And you'll hear me say that several times that you can't test out of quarantine. Um, again, because it's an incubation period. So if you are positive three days after you're, ex or sorry, if you're negative three days after you're exposed, let's say Thursday at 10 a.m., you get a COVID test, you're informed Friday that it's negative, that's great, but it doesn't mean on Saturday you're gonna be negative. You can potentially develop COVID anytime over those 14 days, which is why we have the quarantine requirement. And then thorough cleaning and disinfecting of the classroom and primary spaces where the case spent time. Other cohorts and pods continue in-person instruction. The entire school does not need to close. All right, and then our communication recommendation is you um, notify the affected cohort or pod of the, the exposure in the classroom or in the pod, and they are sent a quarantine letter. We provide the template to you, um, and you put it on your school letterhead and send it out. Um, so again, that just make, uh, emphasizes the importance of having your communication structure in place. How are you going to notify, right? You're going to probably call them first, call the parents first, and then provide them the quarantine letter. Oop. Are we frozen? Okay, there we go. And then here, we just have a case study to look at that shows how this might unfold in the school day. So it's Monday morning. Let me see if I can move this box. There we go. Um, you receive a phone call from a parent that their child, Henry Smith, tested positive for COVID-19 over the weekend and won't be attending school today. Good. Um, Henry's in fourth grade and is a student in cohort 12. He has a sister in second grade at your school and is in cohort four. What do you do? All right, so first, while you have Henry's parent on the phone, you're gonna collect all of the pertinent information that you need. Um, if you forget anything, you're gonna call Henry's parent, Henry's parent back and, and get the additional information. So is he symptomatic? If so, when did his symptoms start? We really base um, a person's infectious period on their symptom onset. So if, Today's the 22nd, right? So if Henry's symptoms started today on the 22nd, he is potentially infectious two days prior, 
So we're looking at the 20th, 21st, 22nd, and then 10 days after that. So we need to know, was Henry at school yesterday? Was he at school the day before? That's the range that we're concerned about. So when did his symptoms start? If he is asymptomatic and let's say he got tested because he was exposed or it was just a routine screening, then we go by the test collection date. Which symptoms? When was his test collected and what type of test was performed? So again, test collection date can be important if he's asymptomatic so we can figure out his infectious period. What type of test is also important because we wanna make sure that it's a test that's diagnostic for COVID. So a PCR test, a rapid test that's positive. Those are great. Anything that goes in your nose, your throat, your mouth, what we don't want to make decisions on and what are, is not confirmatory are um, serology testing, which is blood testing um, that shows antibodies. We really can't use that to determine an uh, active infection at this point. Um, so we really want to make sure, okay, was this a, a true diagnostic test? Was it a, a PCR or a rapid test that came back positive before you take any actions? And where was he tested? Just in case, all, all lab results are, excuse me, lab results are reported to us, um, but sometimes there can be a delay. So it's helpful for us to know if you're able to ascertain where he was tested. And then if we have a delay in getting the results, we can just call and ask them. Um, can you think of any close contacts at school in the two days prior to his symptom onset through when he was last at school? And then has he had any known exposures to a positive case? And does he have any siblings at the school, which he does, or other schools? It's, that's helpful for us to know. Um, so the next thing you're going to do is you're going to inform Henry's parent that he will need to be out um, for 10 days from symptom onset, fever free for 72 hours. And again, those 72 hours, those three days can be the last of the 10 days. That's fine. But let's say someone still has a fever on day nine, they're going to extend out three more days. So they're not gonna be cleared until they're fever free for three days without fever reducing medications and an overall improvement in symptoms. If he's asymptomatic, then 10 days from his collection date. Some individuals will start out asymptomatic and then day two, day three, after their test was collected, they will show symptoms then you start the 10 days on their symptom onset date. So sometimes it can be a little bit of a moving target. All right, inform Henry's parent that his sister in second grade also needs to remain home and quarantine for 14 days from her last exposure to Henry while he's considered infectious. Um, again, it's 14 days based on the potential incubation period. And then this piece of his, her last exposure to Henry while he's considered infectious is very important. Um, especially with children, it is hard for them to isolate and quarantine away from each other. Um, if you have a household with young children, often what we see will happen is they, they cannot effectively isolate, especially if it's a positive parent or a positive child. Um, so really, if Henry gets his diagnosis, and Henry and let's say his mom, for example, decide to go do Henry's isolation in a hotel for 10 days, that is truly you know, breaking contact. And then Henry's sister can start her 14 day count on that day. But let's say they all stay home. Henry's mostly in his room. He comes out to go to the bathroom. Sometimes, you know, someone will, you know, maybe the door's open and the sister sitting in the hall watching TV or maybe, they try to keep some separation, but it's not hard and fast. That's not considered quarantine. So then really Henry's sister's quarantine period is not going to start until day 10 of Henry's isolation because she's being continually exposed to him over those 10 days. So she's at home, she's exposed to him. Then day 10 is when she you can start her 14 day count. So the household contacts are often out closer to 24 days. Um, that may not have been something we talked about last time. So just to keep that in mind that if they can't truly isolate away from each other, then really that, that sibling 
is going to be out for much longer. Um, testing is recommended, but again, it won't shorten quarantine. You can't test out of quarantine. And then you're going to give us a call and um, share the information um, that you collected from Henry's parent and you know Henry's cohort, how many kids are in the cohort. And then we're going to provide you the template for the quarantine letter. And then you'll notify staff and families of the cohort um, that there was a, you know, a COVID-19 exposure in the pod. You're not going to mention Henry's name. You're going to maintain confidentiality. Um, and you're going to inform them of a need to quarantine for 14 days from the date of last exposure to the case. So if Henry was last at school yesterday, which is the 21st, they're going to quarantine 14 days from yesterday. If in school cohort members should, you know, so if the co the day has already started and those students are there, they should be sent home as soon as feasible. Um, and siblings and household members of the case also need to quarantine. If Henry's mom taught at school, for example, she would also need to, to be out and quarantine. Okay. Henry's sister's cohort does not need to close or quarantine. So contacts of contacts do not need to be quarantined. So Henry's sister is a contact. She doesn't, she needs to be out, but her cohort can continue in-person learning. All right, you're gonna close off any areas used by Henry um, and then thoroughly clean and disinfect ideally 24 hours after he has last been there. And cohort members may be tested, especially important if they're symptomatic, um, but it won't shorten their quarantine period. And then we'll start line list reporting. And then we will actually, as we do with every positive case in San Mateo County, one of our um, case investigators will reach out to Henry's family and conduct an interview and do contact tracing. Potentially, sometimes they will identify other close contacts at school, which we would then inform you need to be quarantined. Um, or, you know, possibly another, you know, maybe Henry hangs out with his neighbor who's in a different class at the same school, then that neighbor is going to get quarantined if he was in contact with him during the infectious period. So occasionally we'll dig up some extra um, contacts through our investigation that are related to school and we would let you know that um, again with as best we can trying to preserve confidentiality um, and then we go over the isolation and quarantine requirements with Henry's family and we talk about all the logistics of that Henry and his sister and how to separate them can they truly be separated um, and come up with the best plan for isolation and quarantine. All right, line list reporting. This can look a little daunting, um, but it really is straightforward. So once there's been a case identified, then you're gonna fill out, um, it's sort of a, a running spreadsheet. And I'm actually gonna pull up an actual copy of it because um, it's a little easier to see. There we go. I tried to make a sample copy here. So what you will do is you have, you know, your first case that you're notified of and your the reporting date is the date that you reported to us at the health department. So that's that date. And then you're going to do the, the name of the positive case, date of birth, gender, um, their role, student or staff member, their pod or room number, or, you know, if it's office staff, you're going to put office, their illness onset. And so much of this information ooh, is going to be what you collect from Henry's parents, right? So especially initially, as you're getting used to it, it's always good to have this open if you want, you know, while you're talking to Henry's parents. We totally understand if you're not able to collect all this information, but whatever you can get is very, very helpful. Um, so his highest temperature and then yes or no for, for this list of COVID symptoms. Um, and then who's the source of the report? Is the parent, did Henry fail his screen, you know, the health screening? Was it, did he become ill in the classroom? So teacher report. And then you go through here, yes, no everything that you're able to ascertain. And then he did have a positive PCR test, 
right? And then it's helpful, especially in the comments section, again, to write the provider where he was tested. And then it's parent information, oops, on this side here. And then you're gonna, you know, save it on your computer. You're gonna email it to us securely um, because it has obviously student information. It has protected health information. And then, so that, let's say that's the 21st. And then the 22nd, you're gonna open the same spreadsheet back up. You're gonna write the 22nd. So there's gonna be an entry for every date until we have 14 days with no new cases. And so the 22nd was a good day, nothing happened, no new cases. So that's all you write there. Same thing with the 23rd. The 24th, unfortunately, or actually the 26th, right? Because the 23rd is a Friday. You don't have to report to us over the weekend. So 24th, 25th was the weekend. 26th, um, you get a report of another student. Um, who looks like it's in Adam, this, well, this first student's name is Adam, in Adam's pod. Um, the parent called to let you know that she developed a fever, right? This is the date, this is her symptom onset here. So we have yes for fever and then she didn't have any of these other symptoms. So that's all no. And then her test is pending. And then you would just write here, COVID test pending, for example, at Kaiser South San Francisco, student currently out on quarantine, and then the parent information. And then you'll just continue this daily. Then we have one more, we have a teacher here, right? Um, again, the teacher was self-report. We filled out the symptoms she had. She had loss of smell and taste. And interestingly enough, she was actually exposed to a household member who tested positive the week prior. So that's good to know, because then we're like, oh, okay, there's a pretty good chance that these two things are not connected, right? Um, Adam's been out since the 21st. You know, it's eight days later, she has a known exposure. It just gives us a little bit better idea. You know, maybe this is not ongoing transmission in the school. And then we have a really good stretch here of no new cases. And so the 20, we're gonna go, we want no new cases for 14 days from the 27th, her onset. And so that brought us to, if I'm correct, November 10th counting the weekends, right? So you just keep sending it every day, Monday through Friday, no new cases, no new cases, no new cases. And then once we get to November 10th, we're done. We can close it out. All right. And then we already went over this earlier, but again, just a, um, a reminder on the suspected case definition uh, for COVID-19, what we're gonna be really worried about um, is if they have one in the top group or two from, from the bottom group there. Um, so this is another case study. Tuesday morning, one of your teachers, Flora, calls out sick with the fever and headache. What do you do? You're gonna gather her information, symptoms and onset if possible. Did she work during the two days prior to symptom development and after? You're gonna determine her cohort and possible other exposures within the school. You're just thinking ahead. We don't know if Flora's positive yet. Um, and when, you, when we say determine other exposures within school, we really um, want to protect confidentiality. So via Flora, you know, I would ask Flora, like, can you think of anyone else you were within close contact of? And then you can go back and look in the checklist, the definition of close contact. So within six feet for greater than 15 minutes, right? Or a direct cough or sneeze to the face. Um, even briefly, a direct cough, sneeze to the face would qualify as close contact. So, um, and then perhaps looking at Flora's schedule, but you wouldn't go around and ask the, and I know you guys know this, but you wouldn't go around and ask your colleagues, were you around Flora? Were you around Flora? Um, Cause we really do want to protect confidentiality. Um, encourage Flora to seek evaluation and recommend testing. And then her cohort remains open while awaiting more information. And then unfortunately her test comes back positive. Um, her symptom onset was Monday evening the day before she called out sick. So she called out sick on Tuesday. You have determined she did work on Monday and that she only taught cohort five, which is great. Um, 
She does not report any other close contact exposures at school. And then what do you do now? So you're gonna inform her that she needs to stay out for 10 days, fever free for three days, for 72 hours without fever reducing medications. You're gonna give us a call. You, one thing I did not put on here, but you would wanna ask Flora what type of test she had just to make sure that it was, you know, a PCR or a rapid um, positive test. You're going to notify staff and families of Flora's cohort of the need to quarantine. If in school, we're gonna send them home as soon as feasible. Um, same thing, close off areas with any sick individual, thoroughly clean and disinfect ideally after 24 hours. Um, testing is great and should be done if it can possibly be done, but it's um, not, in a not a requirement and is not, not gonna shorten the quarantine period. And then we're gonna do line list reporting. Okay, and then we will conduct our normal case investigation with Flora, assuming she is our resident. I should say that if, um, for example, Flora lived in Alameda County, then Alameda County would conduct their investigation and let us know if they identified additional contacts. Okay. This one just briefly um, is pretty straightforward. So a family member or a student or staff member um, is in close contact with someone with COVID-19. So let's say a staff member has a mom that lives with her that is positive for COVID-19. So what are you gonna do? So these are your action steps. You're gonna send the staff member home. Any contacts to that staff member should be quarantined for 14 days from the last exposure to the case. Okay. Oh no, hang on one second. You're gonna send that staff member home. Um, no, and she is a contact. So she's gonna be quarantined for 14 days from the last exposure to her mom. Um, testing can be considered, but will not shorten. Her school classroom remain open. So just to make sure, cause I know I misspoke there. So let's say that this staff person works in a business office um, of a school. And so that staff person is, she's a contact to her mom. She gets quarantined. Her coworkers at this point do not get quarantined unless the staff member tests positive because they are contacts to a contact, which doesn't um, require quarantining. So it would be great for them to get tested um, or it'd be great for the staff member to get tested. And then depending on that result, um, the, her, co her coworkers would get quarantined. But the most important thing is that she is out and she is quarantined and hopefully we caught it early enough. All right, scenario one of the symptomatic students. Okay, this is where it gets a little trickier. Um, so you have a symptomatic student or staff member that let's say meets the definition, the suspected COVID-19 case definition what are you gonna do? If they're at school, you're gonna send them home. You're gonna recommend testing. You're gonna strongly recommend testing. Um, if they're negative, then we, we follow you know, those, that pathway, which we'll go through. Um, their school and classroom remain open. Um, their colleagues remain at work uh, until we have an answer. So, just to illustrate this a little bit, you receive a phone call from a parent on Tuesday morning that they're keeping their daughter, Julia, home from school today because she's not feeling well. They're hoping to send her back tomorrow if her stomach is better. So what do you do? You're gonna get a complete list of Julia's symptoms and confirm her onset, right? You wanna know if she meets that suspected COVID-19 definition or not. She has abdominal pain and sore throat, which is two of those symptoms in that bottom, bottom box. So she does meet that suspected definition. Started before bed last night. Was she at school during the two days prior? Yep, she was there yesterday. Um, has she had any known exposure to COVID-19? No, okay. Uh, so you're gonna strongly encourage Julia to be tested. Determine Julia's cohort and possible other exposures within the school, just in anticipation, right? You're just getting a little heads up, though you're not 
um, you're not shutting down her cohort or quarantining anybody yet. Okay, Julia's cohort remains open while awaiting more information. All right, so we can see here if Julia comes back negative, right, we can use this little algorithm, okay? So she falls under no known exposure, she's symptomatic, she tested negative, may return to school 72 hours after resolution of symptoms. So that's great. That's pretty straightforward, right? Um, the problem is when we get down to this pathway. <laughs> so they're symptomatic and for some reason they're not tested, whether it is the symptoms resolved and the parent didn't want to take them to get tested. They didn't think it was worth it. They're totally fine. Um, or the provider thought, oh no, it's just a cold, she's fine, or came up with some alternative diagnosis, right? So right now in our guidance, it says recommend and prioritize for testing, send home, isolate until results are available, which we realize is not all that helpful. <laughs> so we are working on um, clarifying and coming up with um, further guidance for this gray area. I mean, even this box is in gray, like it's, it's such a gray area. Um, so that is forthcoming, but just to, to walk you through what you would do, um, and then hopefully we'll have something more con concrete for you all soon. But basically, if she tests negative, she can come back 72 hours after symptom resolution. But, we did that, right? Okay, Julie, so in the meantime, Julia's out, right? So we're not, you know, we're waiting for a result. We haven't quarantined anybody. We haven't closed any pods. Julia's parent calls back two days later and states she's much better and ready to return to school. They never went to get tested. What do you do? So you're gonna determine, does she meet the definition for suspected COVID-19? And we already said yes, right? You're gonna educate the parent why it's really important for her to be tested. Um, you know, sometimes, even though she's much better, we're so glad she's better. Um, unfortunately, kids can present differently with COVID-19. Sometimes they don't get really sick. Um, and so it, it's possible that she does have it and she was the lucky one and just didn't get very ill. But if she comes back too soon, she can spread it to the rest of her classroom and to staff members. And we just really are trying to keep our community safe, explain all that um, and explain her options for returning to school. So, and um, I'm highlighting this as something we, we didn't go into this much detail last time. So this is, um, new kind of clarified information. So she can return to school if she has a negative test and it's 72 hours since symptom resolution, just like we talked about on that um, flow chart. Or she can re remain out for 10 days from symptom onset and 72 hours fever free and symptoms improved, right? Um, so essentially treating her like she's positive because we don't know. Or she could potentially, like she gets tested, right? Um, and she's positive and she's out for 10 days from symptom onset and 72 hours fever free. So basically, then the last one is um, she provides a provider note documenting an alternative diagnosis responsible for her symptoms. And then her return then would be based on that diagnosis. You know, typically we would say 24 hours, fever free, you know, symptoms improve to come back. Um, some of these, you know, if, if the provider, if it's not a clear diagnosis, if it's something that you're questioning and you just don't feel comfortable, you can give us a call and we'll, we'll go through it together and, and see what steps need to be taken. Cause I know it's, it's definitely a gray area. Um, but basically, you know, it's two pathways, right? So that if, if she gets tested, she's either negative or positive and we're clear on what she needs to do then. If she doesn't get tested, then she's out for 10 days or she really does have a compelling alternate diagnosis. Um, I've seen some, you know, thus far this year, a documented UTI, um, you know, 
appendicitis even, you know, just, it, it can be, you know, there are other things still out there besides COVID-19. Um, but really, you know, as much as we can, we're encouraging testing. It just makes the decision-making process so much better. Um, when I, when I say negative test, and I know that this is, this is also a little bit complicated, but what we really want to see is a negative PCR test. So the kind that you send to the lab, it takes a couple days to come back. Um, the rapid test, a positive rapid test, we have co full confidence in. It's very rare to have a positive rapid or it's not as common. Um, but unfortunately, there's a false negative rate that's, that's a lot higher with the rapid test. So really, it needs to be a negative PCR test. Most clinics, if they take a rapid and it's negative, they should automatically be reflexing to a PCR and confirming it with a PCR. And so it's just a matter of telling the family, like, you know, can you call back and make sure they sent a PCR test at the same time they did your ne negative test or you got your negative rapid? Because um, that's really what we need to return to school. All right. And then what if they're symptomatic and they don't meet the suspected case definition, which is another gray area. Um, so really, you're still really going to encourage medical evaluation and testing, ideally remaining out until that test result is available. Um, if the student or the staff member remains untested, that's one that we really will have to kind of evaluate on a case by case basis. Again, they could return with a doctor's note that documents it's something else. Um, they could potentially return just after 24 hours, you know, like your normal illness policy if it was, you know, if it's really not suspicious of COVID. Um, it's also tricky because sometimes kids, they will start with just like a sore throat and then it'll go, you know, and then two days later they get a fever or it'll be a headache. And then a couple days later, another symptom will start. So it's, you know, part of that is keeping in communication with the family and what does the clinical picture look like now? Um, but this area, it, it's really the untested group is um, definitely a gray area and one that will probably need, especially in the beginning, more consultation than not. Um, and we're happy to, to go through it with you and, and help make that decision or help guide your decision making for that. All right. And then lastly, just to um, reiterate, this is our officer of the day line. Um, and it is, you know, Monday through Friday, eight, eight, yeah, eight to five. Um, but there is an after hours option if you need, you're not required to report after hours. Um, but if for some reason you need to get a hold of somebody after hours, if you call this number, it'll give you instructions. You'll get the voicemail and I'll give you instructions for the after hours number to speak to our on call staff. Um, and then we actually, this is new from last time, we now have a um, dedicated school team at San Mateo County email. Um, so I don't know if I can put it in the chat to Jill or if you could put it in the chat, if there is a chat, um, or if you guys can write it down now or we'll send it out. Um, but this is a, another good way to reach us, but really to report a positive case, it should be a phone call. Um, but for line lists or questions, um, you know, hypothetical questions, anything like that, you can feel free to uh, email us at this address. All right. I think that's good for me, Jill, and then I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for doing another great presentation. Um, I, I keep learning stuff. I can't believe how much, um, how much there is to learn. So we answered a lot of questions. The ones that are the sticky ones that, um, you know, you already spoke to a, a number of those. Um, just in keeping with that is the, um, the question about kids who have, I had a question about somebody who has um, just like congestion and runny nose. So it's not exactly on that list, but on some lists that is a symptom of COVID. So what do you have to say about that particular? Yeah, yeah. so it is a really good question. It is not on our list. Um, Locally in our investigations, we have not actually found that as a um, prominent symptom, um, which is why it's not on there. Um, but I know it is on CDC's list. Um, it also has a crossover with so many other 
things, right? That it's this balance of wanting to, you know, protect the health of the community and, and um, keep out, you know, COVID positive individuals until they're recovered, but also not keep students out of school for too long and unnecessarily. So in that case, again, it would be kind of a case by case thing. Um, I would recommend a, probably a provider evaluation. And, you know, there's different things, like obviously when a provider does an exam, they can look in that nose and, and sometimes it's quite obvious that it's horrible allergies, right? Like it's, you know, they're, they have pale boggy turbinates and they're, you know, they're, Kind of textbook for allergies and so that may you know that would be reassuring and they could come back but of course if they could just get a COVID test it would make it so much easier right um but it, when it's something you know we're not really going to insist on that test when it's something that doesn't meet the suspected definition um but of course we would still encourage it because it makes it easier for everybody and um and we want testing to be avail readily available for everybody and it's it's not a bad idea to do. And um, so I think really just trying to encourage the testing piece as much as we can. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question, it also came up at our last meeting about when is the like ideal time to get the test? Um, you know that, okay, so I'll let yeah, you just- After an exposure, you mean? Yes, yeah. after, yeah, or somebody, has a, an exposure or has symptoms? Well, okay, an exposure, a contact. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I could try to answer both those, but um, so after an exposure, there's there's been different studies done. What I think it's settled around is somewhere around seven days after an exposure is the ideal time. So if you have a negative test day seven after an exposure, it's still not gonna get you out of quarantine, but it's very reassuring because that um, most of the time uh, people will develop COVID and it's usually within that first week, more often than not, it can definitely be later on and closer to the 14 days, but, but it's usually that first week that we're the most worried about. And here, my question is then for people who are sending people home and recommending testing, we're not going to recommend which day to get a test. We're just going to ask them to get tested, correct? Yep, yep, yep. And now if they were, it's different if they have a known exposure, right? Because if they have a known exposure, they're out quarantined anyways. So they could get tested on day seven. I mean, you don't have, we're not recommending a specific day in our guidelines, um, but that that's a good time, you know, or even right before they come back from quarantine is also reassuring too. Um, but for a symptomatic person, it's really, I mean, if you're symptomatic, hopefully it's gonna pick it up, right? Um, so yeah, I would just I would just encourage them to get tested. It's gonna find them a day or two to set that up, you know, take them a day or two to set that up anyways, for someone who's symptomatic, but not necessarily exposed. Okay, thank you. Um, and what are your thoughts? I've heard from some schools who have classes going that they are notifying class cohorts if a student leaves school or doesn't pass home screening um, and meets suspected case criteria but not tested yet, just sort of like a heads up thing. Um, yeah. your, what's your opinion about that? Yeah, so we in public health, we're really, um, we really try to target our notifications. Um, and so you'll see in our guidance, it's really like, we don't even say notify the whole school when there's a case. We say notify the cohort, those people who were exposed and need to take action. Um, so that's our recommendation. Um, we don't wanna create panic. We don't wanna you know, um, raise the stress level. That being said, I understand that and, and you know your school community best, right? I, I understand that lack of information will sometimes create panic and raise the stress level, right? So if you have in your communication plan that you want to notify families when someone goes home sick, I mean, that's, that's your decision. You can do that um, and you can see how it goes. And if it seems to just be causing too much chaos, then I would narrow that notification. Um, so our recommendation is you only notify when someone is truly exposed, um, but you have some obviously some leeway in your own communication plans and you guys know your schools and your communities the best, so. Thank you. 
Um, there's a question about what's the recommended method for securely emailing the line list. And I think the answer is that it's going to be a secure email when they send, when you send it. Yes. Yes. Already. Exactly. So we're going to send you an initial email um, with the checklist, with the line list, with, you know, emphasizing any important points we talked about. Um, and then that's going to arrive to you securely. And it's the first time it is usually, it's a series of two emails. The first one has, um, I believe the link to the message. And then the second one has a temporary password that you use. And then once you get in there, you can change your password. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have experience with that with other, <laughs> other communicable disease follow-up. So um, here's a similar question. Um, and it asks about the, um, the action step, you know, like the, those question steps. Mm -hmm. is, there, is that anywhere before we actually talk to you? Because maybe we want to use that to find out information before we contact you. Is that available? It's, you mean the, the action steps in the slide? Yes. In the slides. It, I mean, that's really just kind of coming from my brain, just looking at those particular case studies. But if you go back to the scenario section, they're also there. Um, Oh, so they're in the scenarios there? Yeah. I mean, I don't think we're, it, the scenario section is not as specific about collecting symptom info um, as it could be. Um, but really the, the key steps are there, but you just want to also make sure when you talk to the parent that you get, you know, what symptoms are they having? When did they start? Can you think of anyone else they were around? Um, and then the other thing is, I, I think these slides will be available after. Yes, they will. And then you could also print them and just kind of keep it with the checklist too, if it will help jog your memory a little bit. Okay, thank you. And I know some school nurses who have been in communication with have already developed certain tools just for yeah. them to use. So if yep. you have a school nurse, um, you can check with them about um, to see if they've developed such, such a tool. Um, Here's a question. The line list. Oh, the line list. It's about the line list report is a site report and not held in, at the district. The line list is a public health document, right? I mean, only. Yeah. It's just for you. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. No problem. Oh, there's another question that's come to me um, uh, numerous times about siblings of suspected cases and whether or not they should be excluded. Yeah. And um, I mean, could you just speak to that? Because that's a big one. We have a lot of siblings in schools. Yeah. So yeah. It falls right smack dab in the middle of that gray area. Um, but I think what you would do is first ask yourself that question. Does that the ill student meet the suspected COVID-19 case definition? If yes, out of an abundance of caution, it's wise to keep the sibling home, right? At least until we get a negative test result, hopefully, for that ill student. If it's someone who has the runny nose, I wouldn't go that far to, to keep the sibling home because it doesn't meet that, that definition. Okay, I think that's good advice. Uh, we've and everybody's been talking about it, of course, because that's an issue that you know um, is always out there, even before COVID. Yeah, yeah. That's is true. there any scenario in which a school could require testing of a student or staff member? Yeah, that question comes up too. Um, so. When you're talking about a symptomatic student, right? Um, it is, you know, and we talked about those, those pat, like those options to get back to school for that one student, right? So if they don't want to get tested, this is a student that meets the suspected case definition criteria. If for some reason they can't get tested or don't want to, then they would just be out for 10 days, right? We would treat them like they're positive. So it's not, you're, you're giving them options, right? Like if you, you're, it's not like you're saying you have to be tested, that's it. The easiest path to get back to school is to be tested. If you choose not to do that, 
then um, then we'll need to exclude you for 10 days because of your symptoms and um, our suspicion for COVID-19. So it, you know, to be honest, the question of whether a school can legally require it really, I think, lies with, it's more of a legal question that we would probably have, you know, a school reach out to the County Office of Education and, you know, have someone look at the education laws. From a public health perspective, there's nothing, I mean, we want them to get tested, right? But it's not, we can't legally require someone to get tested. So if it is a, um, a contact, right? Like, let's say it's someone who's out on quarantine because they were a contact and they don't want to get tested. Again, our requirement is just the quarantine. We don't require them to get tested. And that would be a, another legal question um, and having someone look at the education law at the county and see if that it could be legally required to to make them get tested? The answer is no, but, and I'm not sure if Patricia knows the answer to that, uh, if, if that's been um, asked of the legal yet, but I'm guessing the answer is that we can't legally do it, that you could not legally require somebody to do it, but you could exclude them probably. That's the answer. Yeah, you exclude them for 10 days, right? That's the alternative. You treat them as if they're positive because you don't have a choice. Were you going to say, oh, I guess Patricia agrees because she went off. Okay. Um, uh, somebody asked a question, should you ask for written proof of test results? Um, is that something? I think that possibly the answer to that is that if somebody has a COVID test, it's going to come to you in public health. Is that correct, Jeannie? It will. Yep. Yep. Reporting is, um, it's, it's mandated. There, there is sometimes a lag. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but we do definitely, we, we get all positive tests, but sometimes there's reporting issues. Okay. Uh, somebody asked a question about quarantine after traveling and we did post some guidelines on traveling in our new update that came out today. Oh, good. Website, so. Um, Patricia and her team did a good job of looking at all the different guidance, including from our legal department and um, coming out with some, um, some things that might be helpful. So you can find that there. Um, so this is a question about filling out the line list for San Mateo residents or everyone who tested. I think once you're on a line list, you're gonna get a lot of guidance from public health. So I wouldn't worry about who's who and any questions, nuanced questions you have. You will have an, a person to work with directly every day at public health. Um, do new guidance. I don't, I'm not sure what this question is. Do the new guidelines from CDC regarding exposure over a 24 hour period need additional consideration? I don't, really understand that question. Can you read it one more time? Do the new guidelines from the CDC regarding exposure over a 24 hour period need additional consideration? Hmm. So uh, the person who wrote that, Mary Beth, could you write another question with a clarification, please? Um, okay. This is a very long thing about a scenario. Um, let's see. There were a lot of questions about whether or not a positive, I mean, a negative test is required after a positive for re-entry. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and, and I have the answer, which is amazing. <laughs> I have a clear answer. Um, so no, it is not required. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the reason behind that is, um, the PCR test in particular is so very sensitive that it can continue to pick up um, even dead viral particles for weeks to months. Um, so really it's that time symptom-based criteria that you're gonna use to allow people back. Um, I have people, you know, even 
six months later still test positive and it's not a true positive, so. Right. Okay, good, because that's what I answered in all the questions, so I got that right. Oh, good. Here's a, here's a question that kind of um, jogs one of my pet, one of my things that comes up a lot in doing the reviews of people's pandemic recovery uh, reopening plans. And this question is, if close contacts come back negative, can we resume practice or should we remain out for full 14 days? And I think that, you know, a lot of people write in their plan that if you test negative, that you can come back after 72 hours. But you have to remember, if you're a close contact or if you're a household contact, you, you can't test out of quarantine. And I think that was already covered, but... And I personally love that um, flowchart that you showed earlier. And that is in the guidance document. It's really easy to find on the San Mateo County um, website. And for me, the reason, one of the reasons I like using this document is it's really divided. The top bit is for people who are household or close contacts and all those rules apply to them. And the bottom bit is for people who are not. So if you write in your plan that if you test negative, you can come back. That's not necessarily true. So just, you know, be aware of that. Yep. Um, this is about siblings. We already talked about that. Travel. Um, okay, I think I probably didn't answer them all, but I'm going through and if if you're if you did not get your question answered and you still need to um, and you're it's compelling could you put it in the the q a again because i was trying to group things together but i don't want to leave anything out so release letters from mds or public health are not required that is true the recording of the session will probably be on our web. We already have a recording of the last session on our website. And I think that we'll probably post this one same place. Um, I know I was doing my webinar training today and I see that there are ways to send the recording to the participants, but I'm not exactly sure how to do that. So for sure it'll be on the website and um, soon. Um, I think. There were some questions about uh, childcare providers, preschool, that type of thing. I mm -hmm. um, have been becoming more familiar with some of their guidance. And um, basically what I understand, Jeannie, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you're a preschool or a childcare provider, you have the same rules. If you have a positive case in your community, you have to call and report it. Yes. And then you will be guided by public health how to do the follow-up. Yep, yep. Same thing, even in home daycares, yep. Right, okay, good. Answer that question correctly too. And I know that there are some um, other uh, guidance, you know, major guidance areas for, for, the, for those childcare and preschools. And so follow your guidance there. I know most of those programs um, have check-ins and walkthroughs to see that you have all your plan for how you're gonna operate during COVID in place. And so that should be reflected in your family handbook or some sort of document that you keep that you communicate with your, your families who are your clients. Um, because when something does come up, then you need to know. Like you already, that's where you put your information about how you're gonna do hand hygiene and um, uh, face coverings and how you're gonna do your communication in case there's a positive. So same as in K-12 in terms of um, being prepared with a good plan, health and safety plan and communication plan. Um, okay. Really long questions about like nuanced little situations and I'm not gonna read all of them, but if anyone has a nuanced question about their particular situation, please send, you can send a, um, 
You can send an email to me. I'll put my email in the chat or the info, um, this SMCOE info. And, or, you know, so we don't want to actually, I mean, of course, you can always call public health, but, you know, you can ask me first. And if I can't figure it out, then I will for, further. So we give the people at public health a chance to work on all the cases that are already happening and so forth. Of course, as Jeannie said, you can call her for questions and they have their own nice email address now, the COVID, but I'm gonna put um, my email here. I didn't really um, enter, and Patricia, would you put the info email in there as well, please? <clears throat> I didn't really introduce myself when I came on because I was having issues getting myself um, into the meeting. So just in case you don't know who I am, I'm Jill Vandroff, a school nurse on special assignment, I'm working directly in the superintendent's office this year, um, mostly on um, COVID stuff, but on all kinds of other um, health office and school health issues. So please feel free to reach out to me if you um, have any questions. Okay, well, I think, so oh, did the SMCOE phone line for calling in cases get posted? Okay, so here's the thing. In the beginning, um, let's say back in maybe August, I can't remember exactly when it changed. If you had a positive case, the first thing you were to do is to call SMCOE. That is not the case anymore. The first thing you do now is call the health department and the, the phone number was in the presentation. It's on their document page. We do recommend that you don't post that direct line in your plan because we don't want everybody in the whole school community calling that line to report whatever they think they need to report because as we know, some families take it upon themselves to report a lot of things, maybe not what the public health department needs to be working with at that time. So of course you can, I've seen plans where people have um, posted the general number at the public health department if people have general questions and that's okay. And um, here is our information, some information phone numbers, <clears throat> excuse me, that Patricia just posted as well. If you have que particular questions about about how to proceed with um, any of these matters. Um, okay. uh, here's a question. Are asymptomatic children just as contagious as symptomatic children? That's a good question. Um, I think we're still studying, right? There's still lots of research being done, but generally we think less contagious. In general, we think asymptomatic individuals are less contagious, which makes sense, right? They're not spewing, you know, there's no, not as many droplets being expelled. Um, and then just about guidance for traveling again, once again, rem to remind you that if you look on the SMCOE website, there is guidance that's really very thorough and would answer most questions, I think. So look on the website for that, please. Okay. Well, Jeannie, guess what? We're, we're done with questions and it's not even three o'clock yet. People are getting really smart. I think that's it. People have less questions because they know more, right? Oops. I've been working, you know, already with several schools and, and people really are, they're on it, they're getting it. And um, I've been very impressed. Okay, well, I want to really thank you so much for taking time again to meet with all the representatives from the schools that came today. And I hope it's been really helpful to you. And as I said, reach out to um, myself or Patricia or anybody on our team at the superintendent's office for particular questions and look forward to meeting with you again. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.